how do we yeah. actively steer how this technology develops? Right. So I think that uh, it's very important to understand that, yes, it's very culture specific. So for example, if you develop a, a companion robot for an elderly person, okay, and you want to deploy it in the US or in Europe or in Japan, these three different cultures, they treat uh, um, elderly people very differently. They treat, ro they think about robots very differently. So probably the <laughs> same device will have to behave very differently in these three different cultures. So really it's very culture specific. AI people can provide technical solutions try to provide technical solutions to the issues, but the discussion of the issues and the understanding how to address them at the level of society and culture has to be done in a very multidisciplinary way. So it cannot be done by AI people alone. Uh, and so that's why more and more in the last uh, two or three years at least, uh, there are initiatives uh, aimed at uh, really putting in the same role, in the same room, very different people from very different disciplines, philosophers, psychologists, economists, lawyers, AI people, that policy makers that discuss together these issues and understand what should be the best practices, what are the right regulations for AI, they should, they should be there, what they should regulate, what they should not regulate, and so on. So for example, uh, I put together, uh, together with other companies, uh, like about a year ago, this uh, initiative called the Partnership on AI that started from six companies, uh, but then expanded, and now we have 63 partners, of which only 30% are companies, and the others are NGOs, civil societies, uh, or professional organizations. Uh, uh, I don't know, I can think of uh, you know, UNICEF, uh, Amnesty International. Uh, and so people that produce technology, AI, people that are impacted by the technology, regulators that want to understand what the technology is doing and what the limitations are, and really multi disciplinarity, multi-culture, uh, uh, and multi-stakeholder is the important you know, aspect of all the things that needs to be done to be able to embed this technology with the right values. Uh, yes. You're not uh, convinced? No. OK. Uh, no. Uh, again, um, it's, I wish you were right. <laughs> But I'm not. <laughs> you see. No, it's just, it's just look at the facts. You know, yes, I know about their partnership. But look at the, the, the giants that are involved. Set aside IBM. Let's just you know, talk about mm -hmm. Google and Apple, for yeah. instance. Yes, in the United States, or in Italy, or in the UK, they play by the rules. But to protect their business in Russia and China, we know that they're willing to bend the rules. They will be defending individual rights here in this country, protecting the, the data and individual customers. And they are willingly can see this information to KGB or Chinese intelligence, endangering millions of people. By the way, the risk of your data being leaked here in this country or on the other side, Russia, Turkey, Iran, China, it's just two different worlds. And that's why, again, it's as long as the multinational corporations are pra keep practicing double standards in the free world and, and, and in the non-free world, so all these talks about AI partnership and, it, and it's all good for, 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 for people who are lucky to be born and raised and still live in the free world. Mm. But what about people who just were born and raised in, in Russia or in China and they, they don't have means to leave the country and they just want to also benefit from the technological progress and they know that if, just, uh, if they share any information it, and it will end up in the hands of KGB or KGBs of this world, they might pay an ultimate price for pretending they are free people. But that's why in this initiative, like in many others, uh, there's all, not only the corporations. There is, for example, Human Rights Watch in one of the partners. Uh, UNICEF is one other partner. Um, so really, we need you know, to share uh, discussion issues, open platform for discussion with these other entities. And they will help making sure that not just here, but also everywhere, things are done in the right way. We've heard a lot about how automation is destroying the job market. Um, I, my, my sense is that you have more optimistic takes about, about what, uh, what AI technologies are going to mean for the economy. I talk regularly with economists, and uh, again, they believe that uh, um, uh, AI will uh, 
certainly revolutionize jobs, you know, will change jobs, the nature of the jobs, uh, will replace specific tasks that the machine can do better. Um, of course, there will be a transition period and people need to be reskilled. So also IBM is very active in this uh, space of reskilling and helping even young people uh, to, to, to have the right skill for this new AI uh, um, technology and jobs that the AI can produce. But so, something that the economist was telling me you know, like two days ago, I was in a conference, AI, ethics and society. So he was saying, 90% um, of the jobs that were uh, active were, you know, uh, uh, in, uh, in the 1900, okay, which was an agricultural society, you know, 90% of the jobs that were uh, existing there are not existing now anymore. Okay? But still, you know, like in the US, unemployment is 4%. Right. So many, many new jobs were created. Of course, then, you know, uh, the situation here is a bit different because uh, AI makes uh, the speed is much, um, you know, is much faster. The changes are much faster. But uh, I think that, uh, you know, really we need, the, you know, the corporations, again, to take responsibility for helping people, you know, uh, be uh, be able to do, to cope with these changes. Wired's founding executive editor Kevin Kelly wrote a piece about about robot replacement, the idea of robot replacement. His argument was that as technology replaces what fills more of the functions that humans used to do, we are pushed harder to discover what only humans can do, and that that's kind of yeah, the arc of yeah. I just it says the number in the, the report, uh, um, 2016 in the United States, the job market. Right. When you look at the jobs that require median human performance, only 4% of them require creativity. Basically, 96% of jobs could be gone. Right. So it's, we just don't recognize that how many jobs that, that we're doing today, they just, you know, they don't require just the true human qualities so to, be, to be invested. And um, I could see dramatic changes, maybe even faster than we think in, in the job market, but that's, that's a free market. So, and... Um, and I don't want to, to uh, um, offend anybody in the room, but you know, often I say that, look, if you look at the, at the fluctuation of the job market, so in the 60s, there were kids had dreams about being space engineers. And in the 90s, all these kids, the, new, the next generation of kids, they want to be financial engineers. So, and I think it's just, it was a wrong track because we lost our passion for space. And I sincerely hope that AI will kill enough jobs in financial industry to move kids back to space engineering. <laughs> <laughs>